Hello everyone, Juxtaposition here. Today's video is going to be part three of the Jose and Kitty Menendez professional assassination bloody murder occurring in Beverly Hills, California on um, August 20th, 1989. I'm going to call it a professional hit. Um, nothing to do with Lyle or Eric Menendez. I'm going to call those two little boys scapegoats. Age... Uh, 21 and age 18 and just dismiss pretty much everything that you've been conditioned to in the media for the last oh how long has it been now gee whiz 30 years 33 years it's um, almost an exact template of the Sharon Tate Abigail Folger Lena LaBianca murder where they took four months when I say they, I mean the media took four months to decide Charlie Manson did it because the Los Angeles Police Department never believed that Charlie Manson committed any murders in Benedict Canyon or in Silver Lake District over by Griffith Park. No, 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 no. It took Paul Caruso, a mob lawyer, and Evil Evil Younger, the district attorney of Los Angeles, and I believe five women in the Sybil Brand County Jail for Los Angeles County to um, make a deal. Virginia Graham being the sugar baby and the chairman of the board of the Let's Get Out of Jail program to make up a lie that said that she said, that Susan Atkins said, that Charlie Manson said, to go over to uh, a CIA household off of uh, Sunbrook Drive and kill everybody on the property. But don't kill the three doggies or the 19-year-old pool boy. Kill everybody else. Except that's not exactly whatever got typed up in the um, Lawrence Schiller book, uh, The Killing of Sharon Tate. He forgot to mention the don't kill the doggies part of the story. And um, Helter Skelter, which Kurt Gentry wrote four years later, he forgot to mention the don't kill the doggies. It's five dogs. It's five. Five unharmed dogs. Three at Sella Drive and two at Waverly Drive unharmed. But somehow magically not barking either. All right. We've got the same situation here with Jose Enrique Menendez, who is looking a lot like a CIA operative, okay? <laughs> it's another example of CIA on CIA homicide. Just like Cielo Drive, because Sharon Tate worked for the CIA, Abigail Folger worked for the CIA, Tom Coomer, J.C. Bring, he worked for the CIA as a surveillance barber. Um, Wojtek Frykowski was a Jewish Polish CIA operative out of New York, who was the control agent a supervisor for Abigail, who's only 25 years old and handles cash, right? So she needs some older man to protect her when she's dealing with nefarious CIA operative type characters throughout the greater Los Angeles um, zip codes. And Lino LaBianca worked for the CIA in the money laundering, concealment, and use of money for the Straight Satan's Motorcycle Club, which is running a drug distribution division for CIA out of Venice Beach. You know, where Arnold Schwarzenegger was lifting weights and, be, and won a beauty pageant for steroided out John JonBenet Ramsey types. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, who made friends with Sharon Tate's younger sister, Deborah, who took her top off and was in a swimming pool with Arnold Schwarzenegger, having some fun, riding his steroided shoulders. And then he went on to do The Terminator. And then he went on to work with people that Jose Menendez worked with. Yeah, yeah, he did. Arnold Schwarzenegger. He knows all the players that I'm going to mention in a second. Arnold Schwarzenegger became a gubernator, you know, like Ronald Reagan was a, goob, was a, was a governor, yeah, who's... Pistol was found at the Cielo Drive, uh, allegedly used at the Cielo Drive crime scene. Found, actually over where Jose Menendez used to live, near Sherman Oaks. <laughs> oh, man. None of these um, stories get very far out of the zip code of 90210, right? So, I want to set the table before we eat the meal. So, again, to recap, the Jose... Enrique Menendez claim to fame. We wouldn't know who he was had he not escaped 
the uh, from Cuba in 1959, um, shortly after Fidel Castro took control and ousted, you know, Batista, a military dictator of uh, eight years, 1952 through 1958, and was deposed on December 31st, 1958. And then Fidel Castro, a new CIA operative, Fidel Castro, became the fake leader of Cuba. Don't forget, we have the United States Navy and Marines at Guantanamo Bay during this so-called revolution that we want to have the Bay of Pigs invasion for. But the United States Navy has already invaded the island. They're on the east side of the island, in case you didn't know, right? Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> No, we had that scary Cuban Missile Crisis situation. Why don't you just have the Marines just walk over and check out the sites? Why do you need a, a, a SR-71 or U-2 spy plane to take pictures? Couldn't you just send some uh, Navy SEALs over there, right? You know, in their black ops uniforms. O.J. Simpson got Navy SEAL training. Yeah, Navy Frogman training. Yes, he did. At the, at the time that his uh, ex-wife got uh, had her throat slit. O.J. Simpson was getting Navy SEAL Black Ops training in Malibu, California, not too far away from Brentwood. These are things that didn't come up at the murder trial, and you'd be amazed. Almost everything that you'd be interested in as a juror is never brought up in any kind of a felony murder trial or any kind of a felony trial at all, which, by the way, there are very few felony trials. Everything typically is a plea agreement. And whether you're innocent or guilty matters not. Only that you sign the fourth page of the, with a crayon pencil since your dumb lawyer won't have a pen. And so you've got to go borrow a crayon from the district attorney who should have filled out the forms. You'd think they would fill it out, right? But no, they want the defendant to fill out the forms and then they'll look at it and then they'll sign it and hand it to the judge. It's extremely pedestrian, unprofessional, world that is the uh, criminal justice system. There's absolutely no truth in it. There's no justice in it. There's no professional people that work in that system. So if you know a criminal defense lawyer or someone from the attorney uh, general's office, or if you know someone from your district attorney, county, um, you're not dealing with the brightest bulbs in, 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 the, um, in the hardware store. You're dealing with some burned out bulbs there, people. So, where did Jose Menendez come? Did he come from under a rock? No, he didn't. So, his parents, again, were athletes, and they were successful athletes. His father was a professional soccer player and, who owned an accounting firm, and his mother was a, a world-class swimmer who won gold medals, you know, at the Pan American Games. And so on the strength of their celebrity status, they um, lived pretty well for middle class people, not from the Illuminati. Then we had this, uh, what I would call sort of like the Iranian crisis, where they got rid of Mohammad uh, Mossadegh and replaced him with the, the Shah of Iran, who's already the, the prince, the Shah, the king. And just had the king assume the duties of the democratically elected prime minister, which is what Mogad, um, Mohammed Mogadek was the democratically elected prime minister. And it was decided that he wanted to audit the British Petroleum Company. So we'll just get rid of him and just have the Shah assume those duties so that you really have a king prime minister unelected monarchy. Just return to the monarchy. That's what they did in Cuba. We just went from a military leader, dictator, Batista, and replaced him with a so-called freedom fighter named uh, Fidel Castro. And you know that he's a CIA agent, Fidel Castro, because you'll notice he never got whacked. He never got assassinated. He was never eliminated. Hey, Jose Mendez got murdered at age 45. John Kennedy got his head blown off at age 46. Robert Kennedy got his head blown off at age 42. Right? Let's go down the list. How old was John Lennon when he was murdered mysteriously at the Dakota? Perhaps by his doorman, who was in the Bay of Pigs. Did you know that? That John Lennon's Dakota doorman, who went to look at John Lennon after he'd been shot by that crazy wackadoodle Mark Chapman, that that doorman participated 
in Miami Lakes with the CIA for the Bay of Pigs invasion, that that was John Lennon's doorman. You know where they filmed Rosemary's Baby, where the devil impregnated a 21-year-old Mia Farrow at the Dakota? Yeah, like in 19... What did they do that in film, right? 1967, 68. <laughs> yeah, that's a CIA building, right? So... Jose Menendez miraculously leaves Havana nine months to a year after, after Fidel Castro is in power. Somehow, Jose Menendez with his older sister's fiance, they leave town. Now, I don't know if they got on a Navy boat or ship or Navy plane. I'll bet they did. I'll bet the United States Navy... Um, liberated Jose Menendez and took him to Miami. That's what I think. I don't know where he ended up, but he ended up, um, actually I do, he ended up in Carbondale, Illinois with a four-year scholarship to Southern Illinois University, which is amazing. That would have been just a couple years after he escaped Fidel Castro. At least that's what they want you to believe, right? That he, he fled Fidel Castro. But, I mean, I think it had to have been an approved repositioning of Jose Menendez. So he ends up going to Southern University of Illinois and um, where he meets his wife, who goes by the name of Kitty, right? And um, he turns on the uh, Latin charm and... They get married by the time he's 19 years old. So that's within three years of him escaping. That's 1963. That's before John Kennedy was assassinated. Jose Menendez is now wed to his sweetheart, who's three years older than him. So in 1963, they move to Queens, Flushing Meadows, New York. So Jose does not finish. He does not finish his scholarship at uh, Southern University. So... What I'm going to tell you is that uh, this is, um, there's some invisible hand plan. So instead he enrolls in Queens College where he takes accounting and um, then he quickly passes the CPA exam on his first try at age 21 and gets hired by a premier big eight CPA firm. Today there's only four big eight CPA firms. I know I worked at one when it was eight. Now there's four. So right there, you know that's a scam, right? How can you have a world with only four international CPA firms? What kind of a world do we live in, you know? Because when I got out of university, there were required eight. And I always wondered why there weren't 800. You know, I thought eight was a small number, but it turns out we're at four today, people. So you see what's happening? We're centralizing control. It's easier to commit fraud the fewer moving parts there are. So, I just want you to stay with me here on the Jose Menendez. He is a made man. I'm just telling you, I've been through this career track that Jose Menendez went. It doesn't go as fast as this guy's. He's on a train that's going about 300 miles an hour. My train only went about 50 miles an hour. So, things went in slow motion for me, but not for Jose Menendez. So, he gets a scholarship at Southern Illinois University, but he doesn't finish it. And instead, he finds... A woman three years older than him, his father owns an air conditioning company in Illinois, and they um, elope and go to um, Queens, New York, where with what money, I don't know. I don't know where the money comes from because now he doesn't have a scholarship, but somehow he's able to pay the tuition at Queens and gets a degree and um, passes the CPA exam. Back in those days, you didn't have an experience requirement in New York, New York State. Um, They've changed the rules on the CPA license so many times I don't really want to talk about it. But back when I did it, it seemed like it took basically a minimum of four years. But Jose basically pulled it off in one, in, you know, it's a three-day exam, so it took him three days to get his CPA license. It took me four years. I did pass the exam, but it took another three and a half years after I passed the exam to get my paperwork signed off by my boss. All right, so uh, bosses, plural, because there's more than one boss at a big eight CPA firm. 
so Jose gets a job at Coopers and Libran, which was one of the big eight firms. And um, I'm happy to say that my firm's still around. Coopers and Libran got absorbed into Price Waterhouse. So it's Price Waterhouse Coopers, I think. They lost the Libran. And through the CPA firm, you get introduced to corporate clients. So he was introduced to Hertz, rent a car, which was a local um, serious client of Coopers and Libran. He was also introduced to uh, Lions Container Service in Cicero, Illinois, you know, which is where Al Capone hung out, where the Bonanno crime family uh, had some members over there. Even though they were a New York crime family, there were Bonanno relatives in Cicero, which is west of Chicago, not very far. And that is where Lyons Container Services is located. It's a containerization company, which is code for they lease container, shipping cargo containers that would be used on the Lawrence River and the, the the Great Lakes region and perhaps other places, you know, the Mississippi River, the Ohio River. Uh, barges could fit into the category of container movement. Refrigeration containers, 20-foot reefers, 20-foot, um, 40-foot containers, 20-foot refrigerated. They call refrigerated containers reefers. Um, so that was an audit client of... Um, Jose Menendez, he was flown to Chicago to take care of that client. He was acquainted with the uh, executives at Hertz rent car which I believe would have been in New York or New Jersey. And um, I believe that Jose Menendez had eyes on Princeton, New Jersey as a place to live. It's very lovely there. I have a client that lives there. And um, I'm a little unclear here on the... Um, the time frame, but it appears that he was that Jose was offered a job by the chief financial officer of the Lion Container Services Company, um, and he was being paid twenty five thousand a year at Coopers and Libran, which I think is about ten thousand a year higher than what he should have been receiving with an accountant with no experience. He's lucky to have the job. There's two hundred people that would want his job. So you don't have to pay that much to get a good motivated accountant just starting out with a CPA license. But in any case, he got an above average starting salary at Coopers and Librand. And relatively quickly, he then is offered a job to be the controller, which is a very serious job that he's probably not qualified to take as a young accountant auditor. But anyway, he takes the job. They pay him an unknown amount of money, but I'm sure it, they made it worth his while. So he probably doubled his salary to 50000 a year. This would have been in the early 1960s, so probably around 65, 66. I don't have the exact date. And then within three years, they offer him to be the chief executive officer president of Lion Container Services. Now, this is more than bizarre because he would only be 24, 25 years old. This is really kind of inappropriate but he takes the job so now he's in in three years of working in cicero which is a spooksville town in case you didn't know and storage containers are used to transport drugs right <laughs> coffee beans and cocaine right or processed heroin right you know and that's if you study the port facilities like Long Beach, where you know Sharon Tate's father worked and Lena LaBianca worked, and Timothy Leary spent time down there at Terminal Island Prison, and uh, you know Jeffrey McDonald was the ER trauma doctor at the Long Beach uh, Emergency Hospital there, right there at the port facility. That is a completely controlled area. All the port facilities, New Orleans, right, where Sam, where where um, Carlos Marcello, his town. Clay Shaw, Guy Bannister, Lee Oswald's uncle, Lee Oswald's father, all had jobs in New Orleans. It's a drug importation town. All port facilities are. And most airports are too. So you can have air transport, you can have shipping transport, and railroad, and um, what's called intermodal transport. And Who's involved in the intermodal transportation business but Jose Menendez? So that makes sense because, believe me, that is a CIA-controlled and filtrated industry. They all are. All industries are. We're going to get to Hollywood in a second. We're going to get to the entertainment in a second. But 
Remember, Jose starts out because his father owned an accounting business. Jose gets a CPA license. He gets a job at a premier, a premier accounting, international accounting firm, Coopers and Librand, at an above average salary at age 21 in 1963. This is extraordinary. And then within a few years, he's a controller of a intermodal containerization company out of Chicago, which operates out of Cicero in close proximity to where Paul Marchinkus, who's the president of the Bank of Vatican, it's where he came out of, right? Paul Marchinkus, the president of the Bank of Vatican, personal friends with William Colby, the director of the CIA, personal friends with Roberto Calfi, the number one private banker out of Milan, Italy, who gets hung by his neck with an orange rope with a love knot by the Blackfriars Bridge in London, not too far from the Tava Stock Institute. It's walking distance. Cicero, it's not just about Al Capone. It's about Paul Marchinkus, six foot six, becomes an archbishop and the president of the Bank of Vatican, aka International Religious Studies. <laughs> Nothing like calling a bank a church, right? All right, so Jose Menendez is being sheep dipped in many phases of CIA operations. First, he knows how to count. Then he knows how to audit. Then he gets a controller job. Then he quickly, within three years, becomes a chief executive officer of an intermodal transportation company out of Chicago. Then he gets into some, allegedly, a, a dispute with the board of directors. So he leaves and returns back to New York where he interviews with Hertz Renicar and they're happy to make him the chief financial officer of the Hertz Renicar rental company. And then um, that's a big time job, right? And he was already acquainted with them through Coopers and Librand during the 60s when he audited Hertz Renicar. So he had connections at Hertz and it wasn't hard for them to get give him a nice job there. And that's a high paying job. It probably was, um, a higher salary than he made as president of the container company. I don't know. But needless to say, it was comparable. And he moved his family into Princeton, New Jersey. And that is where the Menendez family had their children. Um, Lyle, in 1968, was born. And Eric was born in 1970. And they would have been living in Princeton, New Jersey, when those children were born. So now Jose Menendez has a nice family. He's a chief financial officer for Hertz. And he works there for, it looks like, six years or so. And everybody's happy. And they've developed some friends and family, relatives in that area. And then um, RCA comes along, you know, Radio Corporation of America. And they want to hire Jose Menendez as a chief operating officer, which is really bizarre. He's a CFO of a car rental company, and he probably has six years experience in repositioning and GPS tracking the cars in case people don't return the car. We need to go pick up the collateral and working with banks on the flooring lines for the cars. And that is not different than the containerization business in Chicago. In Chicago. It's a very similar business model, the container business which you'd be renting that out to operators who lease to clients who may want to import or export products in containers. It's not that different than a car rental company uh, platform. So now it looks like uh, Jose's got 12 years of experience minimum in transportation rentals, which are fine. It's a financing type job where the collateral moves around. You use a bank to buy the containers, you use a bank to buy the cars, you rent them, you make the spread, and uh, it's a leveraged financial type company. And Jose is now skilled in that area as a chief financial officer and as a CEO. And so anyway, for whatever reason, RCA hires him and puts him into the entertainment recording division, RCA Records, in New York. And uh, he's required to travel out to Hollywood, right? Because out in Hollywood, you got Columbia Records, you've got Warner Brothers, you've got MGM, RCA, RCA Records, right? And you've got all the, the artists, you know, from Doris Day to Bing Crosby to Phil Harris to uh, Jim Morrison to Neil Young, 
who works basically for Warner Brothers through don't be fooled people by the record labels, you know, Atlantic Records, Reprise, DECA. Don't be confused. Those companies have very little power. They're just the label to get the artist to sign. But again, most of the money is going to be collected by CBS, which is Columbia, um, RCA, and RCA Records, because they control the radio frequency licenses. FCC approved. So your music cannot be heard unless it's played on the radio. So you're going to have to pay whoever owns those licenses. And that's the same trap we fall into with Oliver Stone when he likes to say that he had a hard time getting financing for his alternative history movies because Hollywood didn't endorse them. That's a complete mendacity poppycock. Uh, if Oliver Stone's movies, if you've seen them, that means they were distributed. And that's the only thing that matters. Okay? And if you've heard Neil Young's music, it means he made a deal with the devil. Because you're not going to hear Neil Young's music on Spotify or on Howard Stern, you're not going to hear those those tunes unless RCA or Columbia or Warner Brothers is getting paid and approves it. There are literally tens of thousands of artists who are very talented you've never heard from and you're never going to hear from them because perhaps they won't uh, make the same deal but anyway, in the case of Oliver Stone, he's got to work with Warner Brothers. He's got to work with Columbia uh, Pictures. He's got to work with MGM. He's got to work with, uh, he can't make enemies at Disney Studios. He cannot do that because you'll be blackballed. You, it's very easy to be blackballed. There are very few choices to get your film or your television show or your music disseminated into a channel marketing model. And so... Jose Menendez knows that better than, you know, anybody. So he goes to work at RCA and he is, his family is ensconced in Princeton, New Jersey. But then this gives uh, Jose a chance to stay in nice hotels out in Hollywood where he begins an affair with a Hollywood executive female person who we'll just call her Randy because that's what uh, the code name is for this woman. And he has a multiple year affair really beginning in 19 early 1980s and uh, and then there's a there's a prostitute madam who of course after the m murder she has to sell a book and chime in Sherry Woods and she said that she <coughs> she that she um, sent dozens of prostitutes to see uh, Jose Menendez during the early 1980s before before the Menendez family moved out to Calabasas, out to Los Angeles way. And who knows if it's true? And who cares, really? So the point is that uh, RCA was going great. They paid $500,000 a year to Jose Menendez to be a chief operating officer in an area he's not really that knowledgeable about. He doesn't know any people in the entertainment business, but they're still paying him 500 grand. So again, that doesn't really make sense to me. Why wouldn't RCA just hire somebody that's in Los Angeles, someone that you know lives in Toluca Lake, for example, or in Calabasas or in Encino, you know, where there are nice homes? Why not just get a local to do that job? Because they would have a look at it, but they don't. They get Jose Menendez out of Princeton, New Jersey, who's working at Hertz Rent a Car. So I don't really understand how RCA wanted him in the entertainment business when he had zero experience. But that's what they did. And that would have happened, you know, around 1980 is when Jose went to work for RCA. And then in, 19, in 1986, um, RCA sold to General Electric, where you remember Jack Welch was the CEO, chairman of the board. And um, Jose was passed over to be the CEO of RCA in his area. Remember, he was chief operating officer and he was angling to be the president of RCA, of the music division. And once the transaction with General Electric closed in early 1986, um, GE named, you know, someone probably that Jack Welch was comfortable with. And so Jose was passed over. So he quickly started looking for work and he found it. He found it immediately. 
and he found it out with the connections that he had developed in the last three years working for RCA. So it turns out that um, that Jose Menendez knew Mario Casar and he knew Andrew G. Vajna. Now that's not really Andrew Vajda is not his real name. He's a Jew, Jewish fellow from Budapest, Turkey. That's where he was born. And he actually was born Weidman. Andreas Giagi Weidman. And he changed his name to Vajna because Vajna doesn't sound as Jewish as Weidman. Anyway, he's about the same age as um, Jose Menendez. They're just a month off in, in age. So Andres Vaja, he's partners with Mario Casar, who's 37 years old back. Well, okay, this is all happening in 1986. This is three years before Jose Menendez has his head blown off with a shotgun. So Jose Menendez is 40, 42 years old, and Mario Casar is 34 years old, and Andrew Vajna is the same age as Jose, which is 42 years old. And um, they are the owners of Carol Co. Pictures, okay? And Carol Co. Pictures is, uh, got put together in 1976. So these two guys have been running the business for 10 years. They started out in Melrose neighborhood, you know, over by Melrose Place. Where Lindsay Pearlman lived before she mysteriously died of sodium uh, nitrate. That neighborhood. And um, Andrew Vaja's wife and Mario Kazar's girlfriend were the secretaries for this little office they had over in Hollywood Way. It's not too far from the Magic Castle. It's not too far from the Dolby Theater, you know, where the Will Smith fake bitch slap happened. Well, anyway, so let me read you some um, particulars about Carol Co., which, by the way, I think that's a CI name. It was named after a Panamanian company that was no longer uh, in existence, and so they chose this name. Now, I don't know why they would do that unless the CII wanted them to do that, because, because here's the thing, people. This doesn't make sense. Um, Mario Casar was born in Lebanon, so he, he was born in Beirut, Lebanon, so he's Lebanese, and he's put together, I think, by the CIA with Andrew Vajna, who's the adult supervision, you know, because he's, he's eight years older, right? So you got Andrew's really driving the bus. And um, they're put together. They work together for uh, 10 years. But they, within three years of their partnership, they land first blood through Warner Brothers, um, you know, with Sylvester Stallone, first blood, Rambo. And that is their first big success where they get paid decent money is they executive produce Rambo. So um, that was in 1980. And they paid Warner Brothers $383,000 for an option and rights for the, the novel that was written back in 1972 before they even existed for the book of First Blood. It's a novel. That's where Rambo came from. It was a novel written in 1972, and Warner Brothers bought it, and then Kassar and Vajna supposedly paid Warner Brothers $383,000 for it. Now, this is important, people, because I'm going to be linking Oliver Stone and Terry Semmel, who's an executive at Warner Brothers. They needed to get together to do RFK later after the Menendez is murdered, but not that long after the Menendez family is murdered. Terry Semmel and Oliver Stone partner to get RFK distributed. And, and Warner Brothers and Mario Kassar and Warner Brothers and Andrew Vajna, they partner to distribute First Blood to make Sylvester Stallone a big star. Don't forget that Sylvester Stallone had a porn background, right? And where where was Jose Menendez's office when he had his head blown off 
in August uh, 20th, 1989. Van Nuys. What's Van Nuys next to? Canoga Park. What's Canoga Park known for? Porn. What's Van Nuys known for? Porn. Does uh, Jose Menendez's company Carolco Pictures with Mario Casar and Andrew v Vagina, do they have any porn money that comes in? Yeah, a lot. In fact, I would say that's their primary profit center is porn, the production of porn films, which brings me to another person who's the same age as Jose Enrique Menendez, right? And that person is none other than, you know, the prime suspect in the murder. However, I'm here to tell you there's a lot of suspects in this murder, and there's a lot of motivations to murder Jose Menendez. It's not just one person. And you can forget about Lyle and Eric. They actually have no means to do the murder, and they have a very low motivation to do it compared to these other men who are, you know, adult men. They have huge motivations, not to mention that they all work for the CIA through their partnerships. But um, the person that I'm going to name is none other than Noel C. Bloom. And he was born on November 5th, 1942. And he's credited as creating live entertainment, artisan, caballero home video, Monterey home video to name a few of the companies that he created, which I believe are all Invisible Hand sponsored companies. And you should know that Caballero, that's a porn video production company, and it's number one. It was considered the general motors of porn for 15, 20 years in Van Nuys, in Canoga Park in Van Nuys. That is where Caballero Home Videos was created by Noel Bloom. Caballero in Spanish means gentleman, so it's gentleman's home videos. It's porn. And so what I'm telling you is when Jose Menendez was uh, interviewing to take the CEO job at Carroll Co., he was already making 500000 a year at RCA. So he asked for more, and they offered him more, and he told his wife, Kitty, she said, no, don't take it. So then he doubled it to a million bucks. And they, came, they countered back with, we'll pay you a $500,000 base salary plus a bonus of up to $850,000, which means you can make $1,350,000 in a year if for working for the porn producer, Carol Co. Pictures. Now, of course, Carol Co. Pictures is also known to produce movies like the first three Rambo films, First Blood, Rambo 1, Rambo 2, John Rambo 3. And they also were involved with producing uh, Johnny Handsome. Let me just give you some other non-porn films that they partnered with Warner Brothers or CBS Columbia Pictures. They paid um, Arnold Schwarzenegger $10 million to do Total Recall. They paid $15 million to Michael Douglas to star in Basic Instinct, which um, I don't believe that they had that kind of money. So what I'm telling you is the bank whoever the, the studio who distributes these things, which would be Warner Brothers, which would be, which would be Columbia Pictures, which would be MGM, it would be one of those big companies with the big bank credit lines with the CIA approval. They would be the ones who would pay Michael Douglas. They would be the ones that pay Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's the same model that Hertz Rent-A-Car works under. It's the same model that Lion Container um, works under. In other words, the Hollywood studio model is the exact model of the intermodal transportation industry. It's the same model of the Hertz rent-a-car business. It's where the owner-operator doesn't use any of their own money. It's all bank-funded, and then they just make the spread. There's a lot of accounting issues involved, and that is why with banks who are involved in the concealment of money, they always use hedge funds or private equity funds. That's how you create companies like Google, Facebook, um, from nothing. You know, you think they come from under a rock and the people who manage pe companies like Google and Facebook, you know, they went to fancy schools. But yeah, they came under a rock, but the money didn't. The money came from a big bank. And then later they can issue stock and they can, 
jury rigged the stock price, but it initially starts with seed money, which comes from a bank and typically comes through a hedge fund, which is known as private equity. It's the exact same thing they do in Hollywood. And that's the exact same thing that this, this uh, Carol Co studio is for Jose Enrique Menendez. In other words, he's working for a hedge fund, but we call it a Hollywood studio. And you should understand that the porn industry, which is basically started in Canoga Park and Van Nuys, which is San Fernando Valley, it's a really small industry too. And it is the same architecture as the big Hollywood studios, because even though there are dozens of porn companies, it just comes down to uh, Mind Geek in Montreal, Canada. They own Pornhub, Digital Playground, which has a Burbank office, Reality Kings, which has a Miami office, RedTube, which has a Houston, Texas office, Men.com, which has a Las Vegas office, YouPorn, which has a Los Angeles office, Brazzers, which has a Montreal, Quebec office, probably at the home office. That's seven porn studios owned by one company, which is in CIA, Montreal, Canada. And you can go right down the list, all the companies in Chatworth and Canoga Park and Van Nuys, they all roll up into basically three or four different distributing companies for porn. And that is a CIA operation. And that is where some of the money is coming to pay uh, Jose's $500,000 base salary. And by the way, they bought a home in 1986, 14 acres in um, Hidden Hills, Calabasas, which they were going to do an almost teardown remodel and add 3,000 square feet and move the swimming pool three feet. And uh, they rented a home in Calabasas. This is going to take two years to do the remodel. And um, so Kitty is seeing a psychologist up in nearby Westlake Village, if you can believe that. And she sees that psychologist 90 sessions in 18 months while Lyle is at Princeton. So this whole story that, uh, that the, the, the Menendez brothers grew up in Beverly Hills is poppycock. They grew up in Princeton, um, New Jersey, and, they, and Eric lived in Calabasas in a rented house while his main house was being remodeled bored out of his mind from age 15 to 17 he's living in calabasas with nothing to do and his older brothers at princeton getting booted out for plagiarism in his psychology 101 class and then comes home and they're meanwhile they're playing tennis and swimming so what i'm telling you is that uh the story that the menendez brothers went to beverly hills high school that's not true it looks like eric might have gone to beverly hills high school in his senior year but he went to Calabasas High School during the two years previous to that. And Lyle never went to, never attended Beverly Hills High School. Never. Never. And I believe the home in Beverly Hills was a rental. Because when you tell me that Michael Jackson lived in it before Jose did, and you tell me that Elton John lived in that home before Jose Menendez did, and we find out after the murder that the furniture in this Beverly Hills home which is a historic home at 722 North Elm Drive, not Elm Street, Elm Drive, that it has crappy furniture in there, just like the Sharon Tate fake house on Cielo. They had the crappy furniture in there for the murder also. And, that's, and the reason that there's lousy furniture in this spectacular exterior home is because they don't live there. They don't live there. And they would have been there maybe eight months because remember their main house in Calabasas is being remodeled. Now, according to Dominic Dunn, they own both homes with large mortgages. But again, I don't believe anything that Dominic Dunn says. So unless he shows me the mortgage notes, I'm not going to believe Dominic Dunn. Now, there is a life insurance uh, policy in play, and it's oftentimes quoted as being $5 million. Dominic Dunn in Vanity Fair, he says that it's a $15 million life insurance contract split between Bankers Trust Company in New York, which has... Um, 10 million dollars of it and that um, credit leonis a french money laundering bank has 5 million so that's 15 million and it's held by live entertainment which is a division of carol co pictures because because see jose's only been working there for three years and now you know his salary may be a million a year approximately and you can get the maximum you could get is 15 million maximum so let's assume that they did that. Well, now, now what I'm telling you is that uh, Mario Casar and Andrew 
Vagina, they have a $15 million bonus payment tax-free if Jose Menendez dies. And apparently Jose Menendez did not get along with uh, Noel Bloom. Noel Bloom, who's the golden goose, because, see, that's who's making most of the money for Calico Pictures is Noel Bloom. It's probably, he's pretty steamed about the, the split on that because they bought him. And, you know, he's the creator, shadow, banker for Artisan, Monterey Home Videos, Calibre, Caballero Videos, Live Entertainment, which is run by Jose Menendez. So... Noel Bloom has a motivation to see Jose Canseco dead. However, the people who have the biggest motivation to see him dead are Mario Casar and Andrew Vagina because they, um, they get 15 million bucks, right? And so, um, and it is very unclear that Jose Menendez would have saved up that much money. Um, during the three years that he was working in, you know, San Fernando Valley from North Hollywood, Lancashire Boulevard to Van Nuys, Encino area, Canoga Park and um, Hidden Hills, Calabasas. Not that you could save up. He couldn't have saved up 14 million after taxes by the time he's 45 years old, even though he was very well paid for, let's say, um, 10 years. You know, he really was hitting the jackpot. Once he signed with RCA, you know, in 1980, he's making 500000 a year. But see, he gets whacked nine years later. So he only had nine years to make his big money. And um, I'm here to tell you that uh, that's not enough money. It doesn't add up. He couldn't have made $14 million after the lifestyle that he lived. So what I'm telling you, folks, is that uh, this has got clandestine services all over it. And now I've got Mario Kassar, I've got Andrew Vajna, and I've got Noel Bloom, all in the porn business, all working in the pornography money business, working with big studios like where Oliver Stone works. And they also are participating in the doors through Columbia Pictures with Oliver Stone. And they're working with and collaborating with Warner Brothers, who Oliver Stone collaborates because um, Oliver Stone has a good friend there by the name of Terry Semmel, who goes on to work at the, to be the CEO of Yahoo and make $24 million there. No, I think he made at least $24 million there. And, um, and now his name appears at UCLA Neuroscience Center, he and his wife's name. They're on the Neuroscience Center of UCLA. Well, that, that's transhumanism. That's mind control. We have all those psychologists, you know, in Beverly Hills that looked after Eric Menendez, that looked after Abigail Folger, right? That looked after Susan Atkins, these crazy psychologists. And then we've got, uh, we've got the psychologist Les Summerfield who looked after Kitty Menendez up to where she got her head blown off. And just so you know, the crime report reads that uh, that Jose was shot eight times with a shotgun and Kitty fled to the kitchen and she was shot five times. Both of them got coup de gras shots to the head, which blew their heads off. And um, so that's professional. In other words, there's no way they're going to survive. There is no way they're going to survive. And there were zero cartridges found. And by the way, 8 plus 5 equals 13, but it is assumed that there were 14 cartridges expended and there were none found at the crime scene. That's very professional. That's exactly how they did it at Cielo Drive with the Sharon Tate murder, Abigail Folger murder. It's exactly how they did it at the Lena LaBianca murder. Totally professional. The criminals got away. Nobody saw anything. People maybe heard something. They're not really sure. And there are no murder weapons found. And that applies to the La Bianca family. That applies to the Sharon Tate Cielo Drive crime scene. That applies to the Menendez killing. Those three murders, perfect. That also compares to the Victor Oda murder up in Santa Cruz 
Soakwell. Again, no murder weapon found. None. No cartridges found. House was burned. Typewriter was used. No burglary. Nothing was stolen. So I'm telling you again, uh, also after the murder, you know, my favorite uh, Columbo executive producer, writer, William Link moves into the Menendez murder house and lives there for eight years. So I'm thinking he had to do that. Kind of like Oliver Stone had to go over and give tribute to Timothy Leary before he died of prostate cancer at the Cielo Drive crime scene, right down the ice plant, 30 seconds down the hill from where Abigail Folger bled out. There's Oliver Stone on St. Patrick's Day, 1996, you know, doing what he's told to do. So all these people are in a cult, all of them, without exception. And that cult includes porn film production. And that cult includes money laundering, the concealment of the uses and sources of money, right? And that's why it's hard to solve these crimes. But I'm here to tell you people that I don't think Lyle and Eric Menendez shot their parents 14 times with shotguns. And the only reason that they got convicted on the second trial, because first trial was hung, was declared a mistrial. But on the second trial, they got this woman who works at a sporting goods store down in San Diego. And she, her name is Amanda Gear, And she, on the witness stand, on October 24th, 1995, she says that she sold two 12-gauge pump shotguns to Eric Menendez using a false ID, a driver's license belonging to a former roommate of uh, Lyle Menendez at Princeton University. And that's how they kind of connected up the Menendez with a shotgun purchase. And that was three days before the murder. Okay, and I, which is a Sunday night, you know, so that she's saying it would have been Thursday. She would have done this. With the, and I'm just telling you that Eric, who's only 18 years old, would have had to drive three and a half hours to San Diego, buy the shotguns, then drive three and a half hours back I mean, it's at least a three-hour drive with traffic, okay? So on, on, a, on a Thursday, he's going to hit traffic both directions. So I'm telling you, to get through Orange County, there's traffic. It all backs up. So I'm telling you, he needed seven hours of drive time, and he's 18 years old, to buy two shotguns using a fake ID. I'm calling poppycock on that. Why wouldn't he just drive up to uh, over to Ventura and buy the shotguns? I mean, that's closer. Um, or he could have gone... He could have gone out to San Bernardino and back quicker than he could have gone to San Diego. He could have bought the shotguns in San Bernardino. That's far away. That's a different county. I understand he wants to get to a different county, I guess. He's 18 years old. So Lyle didn't do it. Eric, the baby, the 18-year-old, he did it. So I'm calling Poppycock. And why didn't Amanda Gear say that in 1993 at the first trial? Maybe they could have been convicted then, right? Oh, but there was cameras in the courtrooms then. All right, so I'm calling poppycock on the conviction of these boys. Whether they did it or not, they were wrongfully convicted, you know, because they didn't, uh, they, they didn't deny killing their parents, and they should have pled not guilty. See, Leslie Abramson, she's totally in on this. She's in on this because their defense was that they were defending themselves from their child-molesting, crazy Jose Menendez father, which is a poppycock defense. These kids are athletes. So I'm telling you that they never defended themselves, which is just how the Charlie Manson trial came down. They didn't, they never defended themselves either. And the guy that they convicted for the Victor Oda case, one guy's going to commit felony arson. One guy's going to steal their station wagon. One guy's going to type up a manifesto. One guy's going to shoot five people and a kitty cat and throw them in the pool. One guy. One guy's going to drive the Rolls Royce down and block the driveway so the fire department can't get it. One guy, 24 years old, living in a creek bed, John Frazier, he didn't defend himself. And it's not even plausible that one guy has the means to kill five human beings, a kitty cat, burn a Frank Lloyd Wright mansion to the ground, use the typewriter, not burglarize the home, not steal anything, even though he's living in a creek bed, but he doesn't steal anything. And no murder weapon. You know, where's the 38 pistol? Where's the 22 pistol? Where's the fire making equipment? 
I don't know. He did it. So I'm going to say that that fits into the scapegoat sheep dip rigged trial. And we'll, we'll deal with, uh, we're going to deal with uh, the judge later. You know, I'm not going to let him off the hook. Stanley Weisberg, he presided over both the trials, the mistrials and the hanging trial. Thanks for listening. Take care. Have a good one. Hit the like or subscribe button.